Welcome to Amp Book 7, everyone. And today I have the pleasure to read you a passage from one of my all-time favorite books from one of my all-time favorite authors. The book is called Rise of the Mystics, and it's part two of a series of books that starts with the 49th Mystic and then goes on to this book called Rise of the Mystics. And it's from the author, Ted Decker, who has been one of my most powerful soul mentors in many different ways. And the reason is that he has a deep understanding of the roots of Christian mysticism, the real meanings behind so many of the things that were written in that book called the Bible that has been interpreted so many different ways. But being able to mine the truth, as Paul Selig would say, the diamonds that have been poured in the mortar of distortion. And he weaves these truths throughout these novels, which are fictional novels. He weaves the truths in and out of them and gives us a deep understanding of what the highest potential meaning of the Christian mysticism looks like. And to do that, he takes a character, and that character's name is Rochelle. And she's part of two different worlds. One world, very much like our ordinary world. Well, a little bit different, and if you get into the books, you'll read that. And then the other world is a world that she experiences in dream time. And that world is a fantastical world. So in some ways, it's a blending of the modern world with a fantasy world. And in that fantasy world, she has the opportunity to go on her own spiritual hero's journey to become the 49th mystic, the next mystic that can teach about the true meaning of love. So to understand the passage that I'm about to read, there's a couple key characters. And at this moment in the book that I'm about to read you from, she is about to be persecuted, actually executed, by several different groups of people who have all outcast her because she doesn't tribally identify with any of them. And her ideas are controversial. Her ideas go against what those different tribal societies, which had been at war, stood for. And so she ends up falling in love with someone from one of the groups. And because she fell in love, it was actually the son of a chief named Kurong. And Kurong was the leader of this group called the Horde. And Jacob, who she fell in love with, was the son of Kurong. And because she fell in love with Jacob, and because they were thought of as heretics, they were about to be drowned in a ceremonial execution with the support of the other tribes, because it was decided that they were so dangerous and they had violated so many rules in that kind of classic Romeo and Juliet, don't you dare get with a Capulet or a Montague because these are our people and these are our enemies in that classic way, they're about to be persecuted. And she's in communion with the divine spirit. And so throughout this passage, you'll hear her in conversation with the divine spirit. And so again, the key characters, Kurong, leader of the horde, who's persecuting her, and then Jacob, his son, who's also going to be executed for loving her and standing by her. Then there's Samuel, who's a part of a different tribe, who's also part of this, who actually loves her as well, but is prosecuting her nonetheless. And then there's Baal, B-A-A-L, who is the high priest of darkness. He's really pushing that kind of antagonist agenda, what you would call the demonic realms or the devil, if you like. And he's the high priest of that idealism that is also leading the charge in persecuting Rochelle, who has been on her journey to become the mystic. So I'm going to dive in. And if there's anything else I'll need to explain, I'll talk about it after the passage. I had compassion for Samuel and for Kurong because they were so blind. No blame, only compassion. Was that the expression of love? Was that being in love? What you do to the least of these, you do to me, the voice of the divine. They're you? What you do to the least of these, you do to me. To you, then? They are you? What you do to the least of these, you do to me. To me. To me, sweet daughter. Again, the voice of the divine. 
You are the light of the world. They are the light of the world. To see in love is to see the light in them, not the darkness they cling to. I blinked. The least were the lowest sinners, but love even Baal, I asked. Especially Baal, the voice of the divine. I sat stunned, unable to comprehend how that could be possible. Love held no record of wrong. Love saw beyond another's fear. Love saw beyond all darkness and shadow. Hear me, tell me, what is shown to be in the one who sees? Asked the voice of the divine. To the water, Baal growled. His voice jerked me back. They were going to drown Jacob and me. The realization hollowed me out, terrified my earthen vessel. But the tender words I'd heard echoed still, haunting me, drawing me. The greatest power that existed in the universe waited for me beyond a door that was opened with a single key. And that key was the answer to one question. What is shown to be in the one who sees? But it was still beyond my grasp, and time was running out. In the few minutes it took us to reach the lake, I knew a fear deeper than any I had yet known. Deeper because I knew the fifth seal was love, and there was no fear in love. The fact that I was feeling fear meant I wasn't in love, which meant I was failing. That self-condemnation took my mind into an even deeper darkness. The voice was silent now, and I longed for it, begged for it, crying out to Justin and Elion and Yeshua and God, all of the voices of the divine, all of whom were one. And I was one with them. But my fear blinded my experience of that union as we approached the pool of death, of my death of Jacob's death. The waterfall was now a gray trickle splashing into a large pool of muddy water. High above perched a large shatiki, a little demi-demon, twice the size of the others that eagerly peered down from the cliffs surrounding the vanquished realm. Come to me, my beloved, awaken from your sleep, awaken and tell me what is shown to be in the one who sees the words of the divine. <sighs> so this is one of the deepest passages and one of the key moments in this entire story in which she has learned many things. She has learned that there is no fear in love. She has learned the fact that I, the fact that I was feeling fear meant I wasn't in love, which to her meant she was failing. And then as we all do when we feel like our, we're failing, that voice of condemnation, that voice of judgment drove her even deeper into fear, drove her deeper and farther away from that light of love, the love that would have been able to allow her to love even those who were persecuting her. That which you love in the least of us, you do to me. So the divine telling her, you still have to love those who are persecuting you. You still have to love those who are on the verge of executing you. Again, her mission is to be the mystic. And the mystic is one who expresses universal, unconditional love. So this is an extreme example of loving something that would be the very hardest to love. Someone that's not, even, not only someone, but many people who are unjustly persecuting not only her, but the one she loves and is about to execute her, can she love even them? Can she see the light in them? And if she can't, well, she's not the mystic. But she's afraid. Of course she's afraid. She's about to die. You know, and if you go back and look at the story of Jesus, he was afraid too. He spent hours bargaining before his time where he was going to be brought up for crucifixion. 
as the story goes, right? This is an old, old story in the Bible, of course. But as the story goes, he spent time bargaining, like, really, is this the way? And his connection to source said that it was the way. And so ultimately, he surrendered to that. And in this passage, Rochelle is having an obviously difficult time surrendering to that, as any human being would that's on the journey to love everyone. So as this shows us, you know, what that high ideal of divine love is, there's things that we can learn to apply to a more normal situation in our life. Like our mission, our goal is not all to become the perfectly divine mystics who have that unconditional love, who even those who are persecuting us, we can find the deepest, truest love within them. And even when we're at the brink of death, we have no fear, you know, like Kuang Duk, the monk that self-immolated himself, like no fear in the face of pain or no fear in the face of death. I mean, these are, again, divine, divine ideals. But these ideals are guide stars. And that's what the power of this book is. And that's what the power of what Ted Decker's teachings has been for me is to just at least inform me what are the true stories of the divine ideal. So I understand. So I don't believe that it's a God of judgment and a God of self-condemnation and a God of all of these things that has been told to us in so many untrue stories. You know, so many times Ted has told me this famous line when I'm saying, I should, I should do this, I should do that. He's like, stop shooting on yourself. Like, release that voice of self-condemnation. Yes, understand what you, what you can do and who you are more than what you can do. Who you can be, which is already who you are. And again, that ties in a lot of the teachings from Paul Selig, right? Like, that we always are that force of divine love expressed. It's just our egos and our human bodies, which have these other parts, that find fear and find judgment, not only judgment in others, but judgment in ourselves. And the interesting thing is, as she repeats, what you do to the least of these, you do to me, to me, my sweet daughter. So the divine is saying, like, if you judge any aspect of anybody, you are judging the divine. Why? Because all is of the divine. Like Paul Selig says, all is of, or nothing is, all is of the divine. It's all divine. So again, these are challenging, like really high principles. But what else would you want from a spiritual text, right? Like you want something that points the true way. And I think that's the beauty of what this book does is it points us to the true way. And so if we unpack that a little bit more, that which you do the least of these you do to me. So any judgment you have of anyone is a judgment you have of the divine. Any judgment you have of yourself is a judgment you have of the divine because you are already divine. You are already love. And it's actually your judgment that's preventing you from acknowledging that. And it's a hard teaching. We're in a real world. We're in, we're in polarity, as it could be called, you know, where we have the opportunity to grow and the opportunity to navigate and to learn. And not all of our paths is to become the mystic, you know. Some of us, the right path might be if we have the strength to fight our own execution and not surrender to it. And I'm not saying that there's one way that's right again there's many different ways to express but to know at least the most divine way you know a love that holds no record of wrong knowing that there's no fear within true love you know there's lots of fear in like lowercase love like the commonplace love you're afraid of losing it i mean love is the sweetest nectar that we can all experience in life of course we're going to be afraid of losing it i've been terrified of losing love i'm still terrified of losing love i also judge myself constantly i judge others constantly i learn forgiveness but i still judge you know, it's not like any part of this is something that I've been able to fully actualize, nor when you hear this, you know, should you think like, oh, I should be this way again, that's shooting on yourself. But at least to have a guidepost to know that we can seek out a love that holds no record of wrong and a love that contains no fear because that's a true love and a love that contains no judgment, you know, that's the true nature of the divine. And having true stories, I think, is really, really important. And so even though this is fiction, it's one of the truest stories I've ever read. And that's the great gift and why I'm so grateful for Ted Decker and so grateful for this series of books. And I can't possibly recommend it further. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in to Amp Book 7 with Rise of the Mystics from Ted Decker. And I also want to mention that 
we're about to head into quarter four of our Fit for Service Mastermind, which has been one of the most rewarding and valuable experiences of my entire life and for so many other people in the group. And I just encourage you guys, sometime in November, we're going to be opening up applications for 2020. And it's just an amazing community. And we'll be working on physical fitness, mental fitness, emotional fitness, spiritual fitness, trying to get us fit enough to be able to serve our medicine for the world. But the beauty and the real nectar of this has been the community that's formed, the friendships that seem like they're going to be lifelong friendships, not only me to them, but them to them and all the other coaches and all the beautiful people we have involved and all the other people I'm bringing in. You know, I'm just still here in Sedona glowing from the last retreat where we got to dance under the sunset in the rocks with Parangi and breathe with Anahata and do all of the different hikes and practices and workshops that help us become more fit and also bond us together as a group to realize that we all have those negative thoughts. We all have those self-judgments. We've all done things that we deeply regret and it's all normal. And to just feel that, to feel not alone, to feel that community is a real gift. So if you guys feel called to that, take a look at it. Keep your eye out for applications coming out for 2020. And I hope to see some of you on the inside. Thank you so much. Love y'all.